This is a bit of a, um, a controversial subject in the field um, because of that. What is useful is when we when when people do see that we measure with ultrasound and that that artery is a little bit compressed. What I do like to look at is the position of the lumbar spine and if we're having if we have enough of a lordosis or enough of a curve in that low back and enough of a, a tilt of the pelvis. What you can do is while you're measuring that, can abdominal vascular compression cause cerebral hypoperfusion. So vascular compressions can happen. The most common one that people will know about and they'll talk about will be the arcuate ligament compressing the the iliac artery. So basically the diaphragm as it comes off the anterior component of the lumbar spine, if we change the positioning of that lumbar spine, sometimes we'll find that that ligament becomes compressive. And some people have these just kind of like weird um, hereditary things where we just get little little different formations of how they work and sometimes they can become compressive. And that happens that arterial system will be blocked a little bit. It's harder to push the blood flow down. And people will talk about that a lot as a catalyst for, um, you know, they'll do that surgery in hopes to help with the POTS. It's, it's interesting. I like the idea of removing compression. Also, we kind of think about, well, that's affecting like the outputs to the lower splanchnic system and then how does that really affect the return of the vasculature? Are we catching some venous supply in there as well? Um, so in short, anything that obstructs blood flow, we don't really like. It's going to, especially that one's going to cause a big sense of palpitations in the chest um, because of the restricted blood flow. <clears throat> we see changes in GI function. People tend not to do as like obviously dietary things because we're, we're altering the perfusion to the gut. Um, but as far as like, does it directly cause hypoperfusion? Not directly, but it can indirectly cause it as a way that we're trying to to compensate for changes in blood flow in the splanchnic system and then affecting venous return back up to the heart. But it'll cause a lot of congestion also within the system, which isn't ideal. This is a bit of um, a controversial subject in the field um, because of that, because of kind of that, that I don't know nature of the degree to which it's causing the oscillation, oscillating flow. What is useful is when we when when people do see that we measure with ultrasound and that that artery is a little bit compressed. What I do like to look at is the position of the lumbar spine, and if we're having if we have enough of a lordosis or enough of a curve in that low back and enough of a, a tilt of the pelvis. And what you can do is while you're measuring that, a lot of times it's laying down or on their side. You want to also access that lumbar curve and see if it offloads that arcuate system because sometimes we'll misdiagnose it and what we think is the ligament as the problem it's actually the position of how those vertebrae are relative to each other and relative to the diaphragm and that compression and actually creating that that lumbar curve people will notice it's easier to breathe they don't feel as much of that pounding in their chest and then with the ultrasound they they can see that it'll open up the arterial structure not for everybody but it's definitely like if that's the difference in being able to you know do some lumbar hyperextensions and get your back a little stronger um might be nicer for some people than than doing the surgical component so if treatment helps temporarily how do you determine if it's because it's helping with the vestibular system or we're relieving compression on the vein you got to measure it so here's where <clears throat> a couple things you can do advanced diagnostic testing where you're looking at ultrasound. And at ultrasound, you can see if we're still compressing the vein or not. That's a great one. And then you want to do that in provocative positions and in neutral. So straight away, and then in these provocative positions. Sometimes that's not as easy to do. But what you can look at is looking at peripheral venous pulses. It's not You're not going to be able to see it as well with everybody. But for a lot of people, you will be able to see them in the actual drainage where you'll see the pulse change in the neck if it's if it's being compressed you'll want to look in the pulsation of the of the fundus looking in the the optic disc you want to see if there are pulsations that happen this is one that we looked at today where we had a TOS case that was considered a vascular TOS case but it also was vascular TOS case due to a shoulder injury, but also it was a C8 radiculopathy. And those two things overlap like crazy. So they were just kind of missing it. And But one of the things that we were, we were looking at was, can we put in those positions where we cause the problem or the symptom and see if that, that venous pulse is evident, see if it causes back up into the venous system um, and then understand how that overlaps. So that can be really helpful. Number one, measure the venous output. You can do that through 
um, advanced testing like an ultrasound, but you can also do it with bedside testing as well, looking at um, positionality and seeing if we're changing uh, the venous system. That's number one. And then if it's affecting the vestibular system, then you want to be able to do the same thing. So can I measure changes in occluded vision or the ability to hold gaze or, do, you know, are we having nystagmus? Do we have intact VORs? Is it a cervicogenic problem? We're measuring that. And what we want to do is measure them both side by side. And the hope is that you may have some degree of both of them that are going on in a lot of cases. So you're saying, can I solve for the vestibular thing and those symptoms go away? And then in the same context, can I now structurally move around because I've got a cleaner movement pattern in a way that doesn't cause that, that vascular occlusion? So really good point by being able to combine and think of them at the same time. Um, you can know to what degree you're affecting both symptoms and you, and you should, which is really cool, especially if you've got some ultrasound available. That can be really helpful. Great questions again. Okay, sometimes when people turn their head, they say it feels like something in their neck compresses or crunches. And they feel a surge of electricity. What could be causing that? Writ large, and I like the way you frame that question, not medical advice, but um, when you feel that like pew, surge of electricity, a lot of times we're thinking about what is called a Laramite sign, like French word, Laramite. And what Laramite noticed was that when you... His is specific to the spinal cord, right? But when you kind of compress or touch off a nerve, you can have an electrical sensation that travels down, whether your spinal cord going to the nerves or within the nerves themselves. Sometimes people will have that like in their arm where it kind of rolls over the nerve and you'll feel it zing down uh, your hand or feel like a funny bone or feel like electricity. So you're, what you're looking for is if you're feeling that crunch or rolling over that happens and it zings you, then there's a likelihood that we're rolling over the nerve in that place. And then we want to think about, well, what nerve is it? What sort of things would potentially roll over it? How do we work on, uh, on solving for that?